I'm going to say this before I even give you the title. If you are in the faith and you are a child of God and you love Jesus, today this message is going to be wonderful. Hallelujah. It's going to be an igniting of your heart, of your spirit. It's going to take you to a deeper level in the things of God. And you are going to rejoice that you have received this word today. But I'm also going to say this. If you are a false prophet, if you are a false teacher, if you have demons, full of demons, if you are a Jezebel, you are about to be exposed this morning. This message is going to be the most uncomfortable, most troublesome, the most destroying word that you ever heard in your life. If you come in here playing games with the people of God, you're about to be exposed today. I'm telling you the truth. I'm not even saying buckle up. I'm saying run for your life because there's going to be some spiritual fire in this house. And if you're playing games in the presence of God, you're about to burn up today. Amen. Today's message, false teachers and false prophets exposed. We're going to read two scriptures, two portions of scripture. Matthew 17, verses 15 through 20. And we're also going to read in the book of 1 John, which is towards the end of your Bible. 1 John chapter 4, verse number 1. My body is trembling up here. The presence of the Lord is very strong in this house. Glory to God. For those that are able, if you would kindly stand for the reading of God's word, and then you can take your seats right afterwards. This is a sign of reverence and respect for God. Amen. Matthew chapter 7. If you have it, say amen. Starting at verse number 15, and the word of the Lord says, I want to remind you, if you have your Bible, these would be red letters in your Bible. That means Jesus himself is speaking these words. So they're to be taken extremely serious, every word of God. But more importantly, the, the words in red are amazing. I will challenge everyone here, as a matter of fact, to just put this in one of your to-do list. Go from the book of Matthew and read all the way to the book of John, the Gospels, and just read all the red letters. These are the letters of Jesus, the words of Jesus. We're going to start at verse 15, and the word of the Lord says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them, mm -hmm. how? By their, fruits. By their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit. But a bad tree bears bad fruit. Turn to your neighbor and say, that's how you know them. A good tree cannot, say cannot, cannot, bear bad fruit because it's a good tree. Nor can a bad tree bear good fruit because it's a bad tree. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down. Say cut down nice and loud. Hallelujah. And thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. Let's turn to the book of 1 John. 
chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Amen. You may take your seats <clears throat> this morning. Now today, I'm just going to say this. I'm not necessarily going to preach this morning. Today is going to be a teaching for the brethren. Number one, I want you to know that Jesus loves you. The Holy Spirit loves you. The Father in heaven loves you. And he's trying to equip every saint of God in this house this morning. It's important for you to understand that you are being equipped so that your walk with God will be furthered, will be enriched, and will be enlightened by the word of God, the spirit of God, the truth of God's word. It will be like a light for you. And it's also going to expose some dark things that you might have been aware of, but question, hmm, could it be? Hmm, I wonder. Hmm. Today, you're going to know. Amen. Amen? Amen? Jesus warned us that in the last days that there will be many false prophets. He said, beware of false prophets. I'll even add false teachers in there. Fourteen times in the New Testament, out of Jesus' own mouth, he gave us warning about false prophets. In fact, he dealt with them himself in his own ministry over and over again. Many of the false prophets were the religious folk. The Pharisees, the ones who claimed to know the word of God. The ones who were uppity, uppity, all high and mighty on their own knowledge, on their own gifts, on their own calling. Oh, I'm appointed. I'm a called person. Yeah, look at the robes. Look at my uh, phylacteries. Look at the, the headband with the word in it. Yeah, that's, that's great. How much of that is in your heart? Amen. Here's the thing about the, the religious folk. They always tried to trick Jesus or confuse Jesus with gotcha questions. The Bible says all the time they were always trying to trick him and catch him out there so that they could expose him somehow to the people so that they could keep their, their, their role or position of authority in the community. They were more concerned with their own position and their own benefits than they were with the lost or the broken or the helpless or the orphan or the widow. The Pharisees, I call them the couldn't sees. The Sadducees, we know about that from last week, the sad, you see. They are the wouldn't sees. These are the people who attempted to follow the law, but they lived in a constant state of impurity. The priests and aristocrats, who accepted the Torah but rejected the law and the belief in the afterlife. These were the Sadducees. Both groups had one thing in common, approval of self. They were full of pride. They believed their own hype. Listen, when someone is starting to talk foolishness, Oh, I'm better than anyone. I, I don't know why people can't see my gift. I'm, you know, I, I just can't help it. I'm just that good. I can't even help myself. I'm so hot, it causes me to burn my finger. These are the ones that look in the mirror and go. They look in the mirror in the bathroom and go. The Bible says in the last days, men will be lovers of themselves. So full of pride and arrogance that they have no room for God. Too full of themselves to even be poured out in the presence of the Lord. Mark 13, 22. Jesus says, for false Christ and false prophets will rise and will show signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Let me tell you something. Over the years in this house, listen, March 8th, we make our 15th anniversary. Over the years, we've had to deal with several false prophets in this house. We've had to deal with Jezebels and we've casted them out. 
We've had to deal with demonic entities. We've had to deal with all kinds of nonsense. People coming in on day one and saying, hey, I just want you to know I've got this gift. I've got that gift. But, but I just want you to know. I'm not saying. Trying to show, listen, your gift will make room for you. You don't have to announce, oh, I'm prophet, bishop, deacon, Jones, and I operate in the Lord presence of the Lord and the prophetic, prophetic gift, and I'm an apostle, and I'm a church planter, and I'm a healer, and I'm the, yeah, bro, and you need to get back into the word and, and listen to some humility scriptures. Praise God. That's a sermon for another day. But they try to, they have tried in the past to come into this house showcasing their gifts, their talents, their abilities. They try to come in, they're not members, they're not even active visitors. And they're already trying to operate in some false anointing that they claim God gave them. And here's the trick. Here's the gotcha question that the false prophets do. If you oppose them, they're going to say to you, well, I don't know how you feel, but God told me. Are you saying that I shouldn't listen to, to God, but that I should listen to you? Are you putting yourself above God? Are you, are you telling me that I can't do this, that you're above God? That's a gotcha question. That's a demon speaking through that person. And I, you know, my answer is yes, that's exactly what I'm telling you. I'm not above God, but God placed me as an overseer in this house. And the word of God says that there's supposed to be divine orderly worship. And you don't speak and, and disrupt the, the meeting. Amen. And you don't do things to disrupt the meeting or the worship. There's order in the house of God. And if you have a problem with that, then your job is to pray for me because I'm accountable before God of whatever I tell you. So let not the wrath of God come upon your pastor. You should pray for your pastor that God would upload the, the whatever it is you need to do. With, upload it to me. Amen. Because many of the false ones, are you saying you're above God? Are you saying that I should listen to you more than God? Devil, Satan, you're a liar. Get thee behind me, Satan. Gotcha questions. These are the same gotcha questions that the Pharisees tried to use on Jesus. Always trying to catch him in a trap. But I tell you the truth. We're going to deal with every spirit here because as we're growing, as our tent plugs are being expanded, the Jezebels, the wolves, the goats, and the tares are growing in among us. And that's why every single one of you start getting prepared because your life could be in danger. I can tell you this right now. There may be some false prophets. There might be some goats and wolves, and there might be some tares right in this room right now listening to every word I'm saying. We're getting rid of the legalistic, religious, pious spirit. You've got to go in the name of Jesus Christ. This morning, I'm going to give you seven points on how to identify false teachers and false prophets. I charge every single one of you <clears throat> to take scrupulous, meticulous notes. If you don't have a piece of paper, ask somebody. Write these down and make sure you get these characteristics because they're going to be important for your spiritual journey. Number one, false teachers are men pleasers. They use flattery. The Bible says that flattery is disguised hostility. Romans 16, 18, it says, For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by smooth words and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the simple. You will find oftentimes the false, uh, false prophets going to the little ones. Who are the little ones? Those are the brand new babes in Christ. They won't go to a seasoned, uh, a mature veteran Christian. Because a veteran Christian say, brother, get recognized. Brother, pray up. The, 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 the seasoned, mature Christian will deal with that spirit right on the spot. But what they do is they go to the little ones. And they say, I just, I just feel the Lord telling me, I got to give you a word. God says that he loves you. And God says that you're special. And you're the apple of his eye. Of course, that's what the word says. Yeah, and God says that today, he's just going to bless you. And the person goes, oh my God, that's a confirmation. 
Wake up, church. Wake up. And let me pray for you. But meanwhile, their whole life is completely out of order. Jacked up life. No fruit on the tree. Bad tree. If you see someone with bad fruit, don't let them put their hands on you. Don't let them pray for you. And reject that word in the name of Jesus. Just saying. We'll get there. They like to cater to their own base. They like to cater to those that buy into the lie. Oh, I can't believe pastor's so hard on you. I can't believe that, that people are so hard on you. Brother, I, I see you're gifted. I see you have the call. I don't know why the pastor is so strong on you. They cater to their own base. They rally up supporters. Satan is a lie. This is exactly what fortune tellers and psychics do. They say things that, that are just obvious. It seems that you're going through a storm right now. It seems that you're going through some tough times. We learned about this the other night, witchcraft, the war on witchcraft. They come and tell you, oh, my God, he, he saw exactly what was going on in my life. Oh, he was spot on. Who is, who's going through a trial right now? Let, raise your hand. If you're going through a trial right now, hmm. What an incredible average. What an incredible statistic. It, aren't we all going through something today? If you ain't, it's because you're already dead. If you're in the faith, you're under attack. Facts. Can I continue? 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 and 4. For the time will come. When they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. This is why we're in an age where people love getting warm and fuzzy prophetic words. They'll even go out of state and pay someone to prophesy over their life. They'll go to other churches. They'll go to other conferences. And they won't hear the word of their own pastor in the house that is laboring in the word on your behalf. They look for the words of false prophets. How about this? The social media gurus. They don't look to the word of God. They go to people. Isaiah 30 verse 10 it says who say to the seers do not see and to the prophets do not prophesy to us right things speak to us smooth things prophesy deceits in other words they say we'd rather hear lies tell me I'm beautiful tell me I'm talented tell me that I'm the apple of God's eye tell me that everything wholesome is in me that's what I want to hear. I don't want to hear repent. I don't want to hear take that idol out of your house. I don't want to hear remove this false spirit, the lying spirit, this prideful spirit. I don't want to hear about that. They'd rather have lies. Let me tell you, this is completely and utterly dangerous. One thing to learn, and you can write this down, false teachers are soul pleasers. And false teachers are hell's greatest enrichers. They make sure hell is nice and packed. Number two, false teachers, they fling mud. They scorn at other faithful ambassadors. One of the first signs is the attack or discredit of other leaders or ministers. These are at the top of the list. When it concerns the dissension among the brethren. I like to use the term dereliction of duty. In the book of Proverbs, Proverbs 6, the Bible says that there are six things the Lord hates. And the seventh is an abomination unto God. That seventh is Proverbs 6, 19. It says, a false witness who speaks lies and one who sows discord among the brethren. Now, there's a huge difference. Somebody say huge difference. I don't want you to miss this. There's a huge difference in calling out a faithful leader 
and calling out a charlatan. Sometimes we got to call out a charlatan. One is done for division and discord when someone tries to raise up something against a pastor or against a man of God or a woman of God who are faithful with good tree bearing fruit. And the ones that sow division, that's the one who God says is an abomination. But the other is when there's exposure so that the people will know who they are. Let me tell you something. This is not a new thing. It's happened all throughout generations. The Apostle Paul himself was attacked by the Corinthian church. He went there and he was confronted and they were talking behind his back. Second Corinthians, listen to this. Second Corinthians 10.10. 10. For his letters, they say, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. That means, you know what, we'd rather read your letters, but don't come visit us. Paul dealt with it immediately. Praise God. He confronted it. He squashed it immediately. He did not wait. Amen. Let me tell you something, church of God. If you have a problem and there's some kind of issue in your ministry, you better deal with it immediately. Right. Gather the facts and deal with it. If you could deal with it within the hours, within the same day, it's better to deal with it right away because when you wait and you delay, now the devil comes in and wreaks havoc. And now you got a big giant snowball that when it crashes, it's going to destroy lives. It's going to destroy people. It may even destroy your own character, your own witness. Deal with stuff and do it promptly in the name of Jesus Christ. There will always be people that speak against you, especially when you're serving Christ. Jude 1.8. It says, likewise also, these dreamers defile the flesh. They reject authority and speak evil of dignitaries. Listen, we've got to deal with this stuff. Especially with those who speak evil, that try to separate the brethren and make themselves bigger than they are. Point number three. False prophets, false teachers, they cast their own visions. They give full vent to their own dreams and their own visions. And most times they are not from God, but from their own heart and mind. And they pass it off as, God told me to do this. They are self-promoters. They make every effort to let you know what they are up to, to get you to buy into their vision. Typically, often they want to be made wealthy wealthy or they want to live off the money of others and then they'll call it God's work they cater for contributions they will tell you anything you want to hear so that they could get into your pocket I always say follow the money and here's the thing now I call it the sympathy prophet the sympathy prophet the one that's always broke I don't have any money right now. My financial situation is out of order and I don't have any money. So I'd really like it if you could give me a hamburger today and I'll pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today. <laughs> Can you help a brother out? Can you let me hold a dollar? Help a brother out. Follow the money. Let me just say this. If you're broke, all the time broke, you ain't a prophet. If you're broke, you're not even a teacher because you haven't read the word. Oh, am I, talking to, am I talking to anyone in the house? Praise God. Okay, that's good. That's truth. Praise God. If you're always broke and you don't have a job, it's because you might be under a curse. Because my Bible tells me that whomever God calls, he also equips and he provides. And he replenishes and he restores. Being broke gives no glory to God. That means you haven't read the word. Let me give you some examples. Can I do that? Luke 9, 1 through 5. 
Then he, this is Jesus, then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure disease. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he said to them, and I quote, take nothing for the journey, neither staff nor bag nor bread nor money, and do not have two tunics apiece. Whatever house you enter, stay there, and from there depart. And whoever will not receive you when you go out of that city, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. That means God is going to raise up the funds for you wherever you go. Don't you worry. And God said, don't even take anything with you out of fear that you might not receive. You don't got to ask. You don't got to beg. David said in Psalm 37, 25, I have been young and now I'm old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken nor his descendants begging for bread. Stop begging. Get a job. Earn a living. Let me give you an illustration. There's a, a, a missionary, Dr. David Makumbi from Africa. We've had the pleasure of hosting him in our house. He has told many, many testimonies, but one in particular. He told us, my wife and I, we were sitting and having breakfast. And my, uh, he says, the Lord told me to get into my car and drive to the airport. And he had no money for gas. He had no money in his pocket. And he had no idea where he was going. He drove to the airport in a van. And when he got to the airport, he parked and just started walking around in the airport, waiting for God to give him the upload. And do you want to know what happened? Someone came up to him. He said, you're the man. God woke me up last night. God said to give this to you. And it was an envelope to go to Chicago. And over there in Chicago, he took the to plane. It was an open ticket. He took it, flew to Chicago. And when he got to Chicago, there was somebody in the airport in Chicago waiting for him to give him a ride. They drove him right to the church. They had a parsonage. He was able to stay there. And he did a whole campaign uh, 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 conference over there in Chicago where the Spirit of the Lord healed people, delivered people, miracles, signs and wonders. And then they paid for his flight back to Massachusetts. When you just hear the word of God, you just go and you do. And God provides everything. Stop trying to fool people with your gifts. Jeremiah 14, 14, and the Lord said to me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. I have not sent them, commanded them, nor spoken to them. They prophesy to you a false vision divination that means witchcraft a worthless thing and the deceit of their own heart turn your neighbor say witchcraft when people speak words over your life that are not from God they are witches and warlocks they are producing divination upon you and this is why it is so important not to receive a word from a false prophet Turn to your neighbor and say, discern. discern. People are trying to gain influence over you. They're deceiving you. First Timothy, I know this is tough. Praise God. First Timothy 6, 3 through 5. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words, from which come envy, strife, reveling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men, and corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. Listen to this. From such withdraw yourself if you are a real prophet a real 
teacher, a real minister, a pastor, prophet, any of those fivefold office gifts, you would have already known that you are supposed to consider the cost. The Bible says no one goes to build a house and then doesn't look at the money, the investment, the materials. You don't even start the program until you got everything you need to go forward. You must consider the cost. That means prepare. That means develop. That means get equipped before God can use you. You've got to be broken. You've got to be humble. And you've got to be surrendered. You might need God to break down some idols in your life. Moreover, God may call you to break these idols in your life. Let me take you really quick to the book of Judges. Remember the story of Gideon. Everybody knows and loves this story. But they forget some really important things that took place. In the book of Judges, we read about 32,000 men that were reduced to 300 men. And they got a great victory. We know what God said. Take them to the river. Watch them. There's still too many. Watch them. Do this. And whoever does this, those are the ones. Pick them. We know the story. But I want to take you to the chapter before. How about that? In chapter 6 in the book of Judges, I'm going to read a few little verses to you. Verse 11, and an angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon. We later find out that that angel of the Lord was really the Lord God himself appearing to Gideon. The word in that verse in Hebrew is translated Yahovah. That means Jehovah God appeared to him in the physical form. Listen to verse 12. And the angel, at first it was a small letter A, and now it's a capital letter A. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Listen. Listen closely. I don't want you to miss this. Here, Gideon has been told by the Lord God that he's a mighty man of valor. Say this out loud. He received a prophetic word. Amen? Are we with me? You with me here, right? I don't want you to miss this. I'm going to keep going. He received a prophetic word. Because sometimes we receive a prophetic word and we're ready to run. We're ready to operate. We haven't even passed the test. He received the word. You are a mighty man of valor. But he was actually a coward. Am I not telling the truth? It's in the word. He needed all these confirmations. He was, he was scared and everything. Let's go to verse 23. The Lord said to him, peace be with you. Do not fear. You shall not die. As soon as he recognized that he was talking to God, the fear of God came upon him. He said, oh my God, I have seen the Lord. I'm dead. I'm dead. Remember Isaiah the prophet. Woe unto me. I have seen the Lord. I'm going to be a dead man. The same thing happened. When you're in the presence of God, the first thing that comes upon you is fear. Holy fear. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. Woe is me. I'm dead. That's why the Lord said, peace be with you. Do not fear. You shall not die. Can I continue? This is where it gets good. Verse 25 and 26. Now it came to pass that same night that the Lord said to him, Take your father's young bull, the second bull of seven years old, and tear down the altar of Baal that your father has, and cut down the wooden image that is beside it, and build an altar to the Lord your God on top of this rock in the proper arraignment, arrangement and take the second bull and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the image which you shall cut down. How many know that there had to be some preparatory work before God could use you? Yeah, you received the word. Yeah, God himself gave you the word. But guess what? There's some trash that needs to be taken out. Remember that little idol in your house? 
the idol that your father brought into the family remember that little divorce thing you guys got going on remember that homosexuality spirit remember that 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 uh, a fornicating thing that's going on in your family remember all these wicked sins wicked stuff that's got to be dealt with yes yes that's got to be torn down in the name of Jesus because there will be no flesh that will glory in my presence because if you still got those little secret things in the closet and they have not been dealt with you are operating out of order out of order in the name of Jesus And God said the very idol that used to be bowed down to and worshiped now is going to be the wood for the fire of the new uh, 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 altar of sacrifice that you're going to build. Gideon needed to destroy the idols in his house before he could see some victories. We sang earlier, idols raised. People say raised, raised. The word raised, R-A-Z-E-D, raised. This is when things are completely destroyed we have to raise the idols in our house destroy them tear them down get rid of them obliterate them nuclear warhead bomb attack pearl harbor all your all your idols in your life and in your house if Gideon dared go ahead of God he would have died it would not have been a victory it would have been a death on his part some of us want to go ahead of God. So what? You got a prophetic word spoken over your life. Amen. Get in the presence of God. Count the cost. Know the call. And deal with some sin, wicked stuff in your life. And then God can use you. I'm going to tell you why. Because if you hear some prophetic word and you start operating, guess what's going to happen? You're going to get top heavy. And you're going to think you're better than everybody else. Oh, they just don't understand my gift. My gift is underutilized. It's not celebrated. I'm going to go to another house. And then you become a wanderer, a vagabond, a gypsy, a nomad, looking for some house to celebrate your gift. Let me talk to this pastor. Maybe I could do this. Let me talk with this church. Maybe I could go here. Maybe I could bless them with my gift because I'm just so special. They need me. You don't understand. I got a gift. It's got to be shared with the world. Yeah. Satan is a lie. Do not move prematurely. Count the cost. Number, number four, false teachers. They are negligent in the word. Somebody say hypocrites. hypocrites. False teachers don't take the word of God seriously. They easily pass over things that they don't understand or weighty scriptures. They cherry pick. I call them menu Christians. I'll take a John 3.16, but I'll pass on a Galatians 5.16. They talk about things that are of least importance to the soul of man, but what is most important to their agenda. They tell you to do things, but they won't do the very things themselves. This is why they're called hypocrites. These are the same people that would say, do as I say, not as I do. One true test is their stewardship or lack thereof. Let me tell you something. 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. This is so important. Don't miss this. This is how you start to see what's happening in the atmosphere when you know the word of God. Amen. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. God never calls us to commit to talent. To good looks or a great smile or to great personality. God has never called us to commit to rich people or to poor people or to anointed people. God has never said commit to a pastor or a prophet or a teacher or an evangelist or an apostle. God never said to commit to paupers or princes. God said commit to faithful 
men. Faithfulness. Faithfulness is a character trait of maturity. There's a, a, a quote from Dr. Ed Cole. It says, maturity does not come with age, but it comes with the acceptance of responsibility. Po prophets, pastors, intercessors, deacons, ministers, musicians, singers, worshipers, dancers, all of them and alike. They all want to be accepted and operate in their giftings, but many don't even tithe. I'm going to let that one sink in. They are unfaithful stewards. Do you know what the Bible calls them? Thieves. Oh, okay. Write this down in your Bible. I'm going to give you the, the verse that you can look up to see if I'm lying to you this morning. Oh, by the way, I'll just let you read it. Malachi 3, 8 through 10. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even the whole nation. Bring all the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessings that there will not be room enough to receive it. I hear it. Here's the classic response. What do you think they're going to say next? Pastor, that's an Old Testament principle. There's no word. Laugh if you want to. I'm going to prove it to you. There's no word in the whole New Testament that says we are to tithe. Wrong. Let me, let, me, let me teach this morning. Matthew 23, 23. When Jesus was blasting nuclear warheads on the religious elite, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, this chapter is known as the seven woes. When he was saying, woe to you, woe to you. Well, here's one of the woes in verse 23. He says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Listen, right here, Jesus is approving the principle of tithing. He's telling them you did well to do the, the tithing, the thing that we have asked you to do years ago. It's a good thing to continue Amen. the practice, the principle of tithing because that will bring blessing and favor in your house. Yeah. But you have neglected justice and fairness. You have neglected the law. You have neglected everything else. So you're doing one thing right, but you're doing everything else wrong. Hypocrites, he says. Let me ask you a question. This is just a logical question, a thought. Something to ponder. When, when you tell your kids something, I don't want you to go there. I don't want you to see this person, whatever. You don't have to like it. I don't want you to do it. Whatever it is that you told your kid. Do you have to repeat that 50 times? Right? Now, isn't it enough once they recognize and note that they don't have to be told over and over and over and over and over again? If it's true, then maybe you're not qualified. Maybe you're the problem. If you got to keep, I ain't listening to you. You ain't nothing to me. And they keep doing it, maybe you're the problem. Because you haven't effectively disciplined or dealt with that rebellious spirit. Maybe you're okay because you're rebellious in a different way. But when God gave a principle of tithing in the Old Testament, he doesn't have to repeat himself in the New Testament. The New Testament is a fulfillment of the Old Testament. He says, give. Press down, good measure, it should be running over to you. Good measure, right? God loves a cheerful giver. He doesn't have to reapply the same thing. But it's a great, great excuse for people. Well, it's not in the New Testament. That's the Old Testament principle. Let me ask you a question. Are you broke? 
Do you not have a job? There's no money in your pocket. Hmm, maybe you're under a curse. The very curse that was spoken of in Malachi 3. Let me, let me tell you something else just to seal the deal here. Isn't this something how we can always accept a Jeremiah 29, right? For I have plans to prosper you, to give you a hope and a future, right? Not to harm you. We, we want that. We, we quote Deuteronomy 28. You will be the head and not the tail. You'll be blessed when you go in, blessed when we go out. But when it gets to the tithing thing, we say, oh, that's an Old Testament thing. You want the blessings of the Old Testament and the blessings of the New but when it comes to something that you're required to do by the Lord in an act of obedience so that money doesn't rule over your life and doesn't control your spirit, now all of a sudden, oh, that's an Old Testament thing. Isn't it funny? This is just a creative excuse for many people to disobey God. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Let's just call it what it is. You want to pray and you want to prophesy and you want to be the head of your a prayer phone call and you want to be the teacher of the class and you want to get up and share a testimony, but you're robbing God? Sit down. I'm going to say this, and this is for every leader in this house. If there's a thief in your ministry, don't you dare let them speak Pray over anyone, prophesy, teach, do anything. When a thief has been found out, he's to be silent or she's to be silent. They could come because they need Jesus. They could come to church. Some of them, you might look around today, you might not see them back next week. Because they're seething in their own seat right now. <laughs> seething. Upset. He's picking on me. No, I'm exposing you. Hey. To the whole church. If I see a thief that has been brought to my attention coming in here and laying hands on people, I'm going to stop playing that piano and I'm going to tell you, sit down in the name of Jesus. I'm telling you, it's going out like that going forward. We're shutting it down in this house. You know why? Because the Bible calls that a strange fire. When you give a person just a little inch and they're coming in here worshiping, doing whatever they're doing up here, and their house is out of order, that's a strange fire. And it can't happen. And I know I'm going to make enemies for that, but it's okay because the Lord affirms that word. It's in his word. 1 Timothy 1, 5 through 7. Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith from which some, having strayed, have turned aside to idle talk, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm. I have a new one for you. Pharisees, Sadducees, the couldn't sees, wouldn't sees. Here's the new one, and the wannabes. They want to be you. They want to be somebody. But they don't want to count the cost. Listen, there were wannabes in Jesus' day. The scribes, Matthew 23, verse 2 and 3. The scribes and Pharisees, they sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. But do not do anything according to their works. For they say and do not do. Number five, false prophets and false teachers oftentimes wear masks, camouflage. They sugarcoat speeches and conduct demonstrations to deceive simple souls, the simple ones. They lure you with golden expressions. That means colorful words and colorful demonstrations. I call them soul-killing pills gold covered pills designed to kill you listen think about a prostitute before she cashes her money before she performs her acts doesn't she perfume her body and comb her hair and put on the grimiest outfit to lure you in doesn't she first prepare her bed and prepare her herself ratchet 
right? To lure you in like bait. And then in the end, disease. I remember hearing a testimony back in the 90s. There was a prostitute. This man of God was seduced by a prostitute. She was appealing to him over and over and over because he was a Christian. And he was trying to fight the good fight of faith. But because he had been so uh, conditioned to pornography, he got weak. Pornography. He couldn't help it. He says, who's going to know? No one's going to find out. And he went and slept with this prostitute that was always trying to seduce him. And at the end of their meeting, she said, welcome to the wonderful world of AIDS. He divorced his wife, left his family, and no one ever heard of him again. A simple night of pleasure can destroy your life. 2 Corinthians 11, 11 through 13. I, I don't know if that's a typo. In my, in my sheet here, it says 13 through 15. You might need to re rewrite that. It says, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. That means deception. And no wonder... For Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. That means those that run with the enemy can pretend to be prophets, priests, pastors, teachers, just like that. Romans 16, verses, six, uh, Romans 16, verses 17 through 18. I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. For those are such who do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ but their own belly and smooth words, flattering speech, and deceive the hearts of the simple. Verse uh, number 6. False teachers and false prophets, they want followers. They strive to win people over to themselves. I call it the Luciferian spirit. Once a false teacher is exposed or a false prophet is exposed, the first thing they do is try to gather up followers to support them and rally with them to discredit, mock, or oppose the person who exposed them. Lucifer. That's exactly what he did. And this is how cults are formed. And once they get them, they pollute them and destroy them. Listen to the words of Jesus. Matthew 23, 15. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte. That means a soul. And when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourself. Number seven. They have the eyes, their eyes on the prize. Somebody say money. money. They eyeball your goods more than your good. They covet. They serve themselves more than serving the souls. These are pickpockets and purse snatchers. They teach you false principles so that they can benefit themselves. Jeremiah 6. 13 because from the least of them even to the greatest of them everyone is given to covetousness and from the prophet even to the priest everyone deals falsely write this down next to that verse follow the money first peter 1 1 through 3 but there were also false prophets among the people even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies and denying the Lord who brought them and bring upon themselves a swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time, their judgment has not been idle and their destruction does not slumber. False teachers are always going to gain influence two ways. Number one, they will always start with sincerity and truth and purity of motives because that's how they draw you in. 
but as time continues pride will continue to flood their heart and they begin to express false humility they give into their own lust and their own immoral desires and covetousness and their commitment to Christ eventually dies they begin to focus on their own selves number two they also are not ever or truly were never committed to Christ at all they are strategically placed by Satan to do his bidding sometimes they're aware sometimes they are not aware but they will use their charisma their talents their gifts to try to gain influence over the people and once they are discovered it brings shame to the body of Christ so how do we know Saints of God how do we know the false teachers and the false prophets it's very simple Jesus said it right when we read earlier he says you will know them by their fruit what does that mean by their characteristics you will know them how by testing the fruit a good tree bears good fruit a bad tree bears bad fruit the Bible says by their fruits you will know them write this down and do this for homework Galatians 5 19 through 26 as a matter of fact you should just read the whole chapter but this chapter is very important because it will tell you what a Christian looks like it'll also tell you what a worldly person looks like the fruits of the Spirit are evident clearly seen but also are the works of the flesh they are manifest that means evident clearly seen visible you can see when people are talking and cursing and acting vile and twerking how about this you know you got Christians it's, it's mind-boggling to me Christians doing this it's amazing it's sad it makes my heart hurt or yo 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 a little umbrella sticking out yo this is why you're supposed to know what you're dealing with at the club on Saturday night getting your freak on and in the morning on Sunday morning you're like this hallelujah holy is the Lord God Almighty five ways really quick to test the fruits and the spirit of a teacher let me just give you this scripture to put in your notes as well I, I hope you're doing some homework this week as we come to the close here 2 Timothy 2 15 it says study show thyself approve a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightfully dividing the word of truth five ways you could test the spirit number one discern the character of the person again Galatians 5 will tell you look at them discern their character do they have a diligent prayer life does this person have a deep devotion to God does this person demonstrate the fruits of the spirit or do they fly off the handle do they have no self-control does this person love sinners does this person hate wickedness and love righteousness does this person cry out to God against sin number two discern the motives I'm going to give you scriptures again homework Philippians 1 20 and 1 Corinthians 9 19 through 22 when you're looking at the motives does the person honor Christ does the person lead church into sanctification does this person reach out to the lost does this person proclaim and defend the gospel the third point test the fruit in life and message Matthew 7 16 again it says you will know them by their fruit a fruit of false teachers will be found mostly in the converts and even on the tree themselves because they themselves are not committed to Christ or his word and neither are their little followers examine the character of the people are they submitted are they plugged into a church community I can't stress this enough most false prophets and most false teachers they won't even become a member of a church they won't attend membership classes they won't be connected to the body why because they want to be free 
There's no accountability. There's no reason to be connected to a body of believers. No way, Jose. That's a tall tale sign right there. Nope, I don't want to be part of this church. Well, then sit down. Because you ain't going to be ministering up here. Praise God. Examine the family. Hmm, that's a good way of looking at it. How does the family feel about them? Have they been evicted? Have they been ostracized? Is their family supportive of them? There must be something wrong. Look at the tree. Look at the family. Examine the history. Examine the patterns. Examine the routines. It's a wonder to me why more pastors don't vet people before they put them on a platform. It's a wonder to me. When the people themselves, oh, can I do this? Can I perform here? Can I do this? Can I come to your church? Can I do a class in your church? Can I lead your Bible study? Can I, yeah, hold on. Can I talk to your pastor? Amen. What's your pastor's name? What's his number? Let, let me talk to your pastor. Let me see if you're on discipline. Let me see if you're submitted. Let me see if you're a faithful steward. Let me see if you're plugged in. Let me see if you show up on prayer night. Are you the first one in or the last one? Are you late every week? Let me talk to your pastor. Because no one comes here unless they're vetted. So would you have a problem with me calling your pastor? Oh, you, you do? Okay, no problem. Then you won't be here today. You could come and visit, but you ain't going to be here. I wish more pastors would do that. Praise God. Yes, it narrows the playing field. Yes, that means less people. So what? If I got to preach here every week, that's my job. That's a, I'm called to do it. I'll do it till I die. There's no retirement in the Lord. I don't know how that happens either. I remember when I had knee replacements. I had a table put out there. You remember? And they put it. My leg was on a chair like this. And my crutch is on my shoulder. I say, let's turn to John chapter 3. And you know what? Some people have a cough. <laughs> I'm not coming to church. I got 150 staples in my knee, an artificial knee. And I'm coming here preaching the word of God. Listen, when you are called, nothing could stop you. Discern the reliance on scripture. 2 John 9, 11. I'm going to read this one. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. So when people start talking to you and they say, oh, well, that's an Old Testament thing. That's a New Testament thing. Or when they start cherry picking, red flag. <laughs> When they teach you to submit to some verses, but not the entire counsel of God's word, the whole counsel or the whole context. And how about this? Do they submit themselves to the own scriptures that they're, they're cherry picking? The fifth point. Test the integrity with the Lord's money. First Timothy 3, 3. They must not be given to wine. Not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous. 1 Timothy 6, 9 through 10. 1, Tim 1 Timothy 3, 3 and 1 Timothy 6, 9 through 10. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and have pierced themselves with uh, through with many sorrows. Listen, money is not evil. Money is a commodity. Just like a gun. A gun is not evil. It's evil when there's an evil person holding the gun. Money is to your benefit, just like electricity is not evil unless you mismanage it. Fire is not evil unless you mismanage it. It'll kill you. You understand? That's why the Bible gives the principle of tithing and sowing seed and giving because it will keep you free from bondage. My son gave me a great quote. I tell it at every discipleship class. Money can be a wonderful servant, but it could also be a cruel master. 
If you are a tither and you tithe biblically, that means 10%, I promise you, you're going to have so much in abundance that you ain't going to even have room to store it. You'll never know what I'm talking about until you begin to trust God. But then you will be found faithful before God and God removes the curse off of all. The Bible says he will bless the labor of your hands. Your 90% will be more blessed than the whole 100%. And you'll be amazed at how you live. Do they refuse to take large sums of money for themselves? Or do they handle finances with respect, honesty, and integrity? Do they seek to promote God's work? Or do they have a giving heart? These are questions that need to be answered. Sister Donna, I'll have you come now as we close. The enemy has his hand many times in the mixing bowl when it comes to false teachers and false prophets. There are many that try to come into every house. I believe Alexander Pagani, he just spoke about a cult that has been a, a, a coming to his church. They call the new heaven and the new earth cult. And they're creeping in, coming in, and clapping to the songs and worshiping. And then at the end of service, they're passing out little tracks. Hey, come here. Come, come to our study. Come here. Come. And, they're, and they're, it's a spirit that's coming in the midst. Church, you've got to be on guard now. The devil will use people like puppets to do his bidding. He will even allow them to have a level of success to make them think that they are right and in good standing with God. They begin to deceive even themselves. Well, God called me. I had a prophetic word. Who cares? Look at the tree. It's jacked up. Is it? Is it me? I'm wondering, am I the only one that sees this? Divorce people giving counsel. People that their own house is jacked up and telling you how to keep your man happy. I mean, really. People that have addictions and telling you it's okay. Don't smoke that much. Just smoke once in a while. As long as you're cutting down, God sees it. The effort. God sees the effort. Instead of 10 joints a day, just take two. And if you need to, pop a quaalude. Do they still do quaaludes? Or is that a 70s thing? Pop some acid. It'll help. It'll take off the edge. It's mine. Let me tell you, you know why I say that? There's a pastor now, I think in Atlanta, Georgia, that he wanted to get the, the youth to come to church. So you know what he did? He built a whole farm of weed, marijuana. The church sits on a five-acre property. He said, let's teach the young people how to cultivate and farm, and let's te teach them agriculture. Being that weed is free and, and weed is now legal, we can now teach them agriculturally and teach them how to harvest weed. And when they know that they could smoke weed and still come to church, just think of how many people we could reach for Jesus. Pornography is legal, but it's not good for you. Alcohol is legal, but it's not good for you. Weed is legal, but it's not good for you. Right? The Bible says, be ye sober-minded and vigilant. Keep watch for the days we are in are evil. Galatians 6, 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Yeah, Galatians 6, 7. I'm, I'm, I'm coming to the close. This is my third close. Hallelujah. The war on witchcraft. We saw it on Wednesday night. And it ended with a powerful word. The word is knowing. How do we get set free? How do we keep ourselves in the spirit? How do we know who we're dealing with? Number one, the word is knowing. You must know your God. Have an assuredness of salvation. What verses do you stand on? What verses are you going to cry out to when Satan tries to come to you and lie to you and tell you that you're going to hell? What is the verse that you stand on? Let me help you, saints. Take some pictures. Here are some verses that you need to have in your Bible and memorize them. 
and write them up. These are assurance of salvation verses. Somebody take this picture and post it on our church group page. Everyone needs to have this. You must be able to know your purpose, your position, your potential in God's kingdom. And, uh, and the day that wicked comes your way, and when people start giving you their own version of truth, you know everybody has a version of truth now. You've got to know the truth. The way, the truth, and the life. And it only comes by way of relationship. Our government, our entertainment, the Grammys, the most demonic show on earth. The movies, the music. Some of these artists are not even hiding it anymore. They're so demonic. The kids programs, the video games, evil is everywhere. There are false teachers and prophets and doctrines everywhere. They're looming everywhere. Even today, the Super Bowl is going to be one of the most demonic halftime shows on planet Earth. Even the commercials. I'm skeptical of even the commercials. This world defies God. They are blasphemers against God. America itself has fallen into paganism, into Baal worship, Hinduism, occult. We've got people doing yoga in the church. Jonathan Kahn, I'm quoting him. He said, there are more witches now in USA than there are Presbyterians. Wicca is the fastest growing religion, greater even than the growth of Islam. This is why God is saying, wake up, d d uh, discern those that are among you, and lead by example. Be the light. I end with this scripture. Ephesians 5, 11, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Don't worry about what people say if they don't like you or anything. Just be the light and expose the wolves in the sheep's clothing. God bless you today, saints of the Most High God. Praise the Lord. I know it was a little lengthy, but you guys needed that, and it's in your spirit. And you could go back on the notes and the podcast and share it with a friend. Hallelujah. Let's bow our heads this morning. For the purpose of time, I'm just going to pray for everybody. Heavenly Father, mission accomplished. Assignment complete. I pray for the sheep in this house. I even pray for the goats. I pray for every vessel in this room. I pray, oh God, that as we have learned from your word, that our sword is now sharp, sharpened. That you would raise up people with courage in this place. People that would even be able to reject a false word and say to the person, I don't receive that. Please don't put your hand on me. Please don't pray over my life. Protect our people, Lord God. Protect our sons and daughters. Protect our families. Protect husbands. Protect wives. Protect those ministers that are truly seeking after your heart. Oh God, I pray, oh Lord, that even with correction, oh God, that we would be able to humble ourselves, oh God. And say, Lord, there's so much residue. Lord, I got to take my altars to bail. I got to take my altars to pornography, to, to cigarettes, to alcohol, to drugs, to whatever it is. Our phones, our Facebooks, and social media, and Twitters, and all that stuff, oh God. Lord, we submit it to you, oh God. Whatever it is that's holding me back, oh God, we put it on the altar of sacrifice today, oh God. Shield us, O oh Lord, from all the evil around us, O oh Lord. May we walk worthy of the call that is upon our life. If we have faltered, if we have gone wayward, if we have misspoken or misstepped, if we had entered in an era, O oh God, correct us now. O oh God, have mercy, O oh God, as we repent ourselves, O oh Lord. I pray, O oh God, that from this day forward, O oh God, that we would be wise as serpents, but as harmless as doves, that we would speak up when we have to, that we would confront matters when they need to be confronted right on the spot so that our brothers and sisters would not fall off the path 
and into realms of darkness and, and unrighteousness where they believe their own hype and where they go to different places, oh God, and, and, and continue to minister doctrines of devils with bad bearing fruit. Lord God, protect your people. The days that we're in are evil days, oh God. We repent, oh God. We ask for your forgiveness, oh God. And we pray, oh God, that you would open up our eyes to see into the spirit realm, oh God. That we would have a heightened level of discernment. Increase our faith. Give us wisdom, oh God. Thank you, Lord God. You are awesome. You are mighty. And thank you, Lord, for your favor upon us, for your mercies that are new every single morning. We give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Intercessors, where are you? Just raise your hand wherever you are. I'm not asking you to get up. But if you are an intercessor after church, again, please, I want the whole altar. Just come on up. If there's anyone here that needs personal ministry, our intercessors will meet you at the altar at the end of service, and they will pray over you. Amen? Praise the Lord. Let's raise our hand for the blessing this morning. Glory to God. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you, and may the Lord be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you, and may he give you his peace. Glory to God. Amen. Quickly, uh, a quick announcement. Uh, ladies, I believe next week, Sunday the 19th, uh, the monies for the workbooks are due. It's $108. If you need help or you need time, please see Pastor Francis. But if not, we will collect the funds on the 19th and the 20th this morning. Uh, excuse me, in the morning, Monday morning, we're going to order the books. Amen. Sister Trudy has a swipe machine. If you'd like to take care of the books, you could do that there as well. Amen. Let's stand to our feet as we are going to be dismissed in a few moments. We're going to pray. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Let's see. Pastor Shadrach, let me have you come on up. Amen. Would you pray over the offering and the benediction this morning? And worship team, could you come forward? Thank you, Pastor. Uh, Sister Elizabeth or whoever is, is uh, going to be doing the clicker. If